there's no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast life my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is holy bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me Thank you. 
With a sense that, well, for me anyway, with a sense that I don't know what words to use to pray, and also a sense that we're singing them. We're singing our praises to you, but we're singing our prayers. We're acknowledging, Lord, that it's not I, it's not us, it's not we, but it's only through the you in us, it's only through Christ in us that we can do anything of value in this world and in your kingdom. And so we recognize your greatness this morning, Father, but also are humbled that in your greatness and your majesty and the creator of the whole earth is interested in us, is interested in our praises and interested in our prayers, is interested in our, our futile, what may seem futile to us, our efforts. But to you, whatever we say or do in your name is precious because it's a response to the free gift that you've given us in Jesus' death and resurrection. So Lord, we say thank you. We 
say thank you for the work you've done in our lives. Thank you for the work that you're going to continue to do. And we say, Lord, please, breathe us. Breathe on us afresh today. Breathe your Holy Spirit into us. Because we keep needing filled and refilled and refilled again. So would you fill us to overflowing with the new wine of your Holy Spirit within us so that we would love what you love and do what you do. And Lord, sometimes when we don't know how to pray, you've taught us. You've taught us the format, the structure, and even some words. As we may say together, our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Dear loving Heavenly Father, bless all who worry, who are in pain, who are suffering, who have lost hope, all who are lonely, anxious, depressed or in grief. Fill them with your light, your love, your healing and with the great joy that comes from knowing you. Bless and protect us all. We ask that you would touch the hearts of all those we know and that Mike has named already earlier on who are grieving or recovering from surgery or illness and in need of your strength. In a moment of peace now, we name silently before you anyone we know who is in need for whatever reason and we ask that you would fill them with your love, your power and show them the light of your grace. We lift up before you all those involved in governments governments of the world and our government at whatever level. Help them to guide the countries and this country through these very difficult COVID-19 and economically strained days and into the best possible position where everyone is safe, warm, well fed and comfortably housed. Father, help them to do this with honesty and with integrity, without favour to protect people's health, their jobs, their businesses and livelihoods and we ask that you guide them to make the correct decisions for the benefit of us all. We pray for our head teachers and all other teachers, classroom assistants and other school staff, and thank you for all those who have chosen to teach and encourage our young people in primary, secondary schools, colleges and universities. We ask for your protection and guidance for them as they look to plan for the safe reopening of schools in August and colleges later on this year. And we thank you for their efforts in keeping our children eh, encouraged and taught at the moment. Father, we also pray for all our church leaders in whatever role that you will touch them and give them the power to undertake their calling in the best possible manner, especially Mike as he leads us. 
help our leadership to be guided as to the practicalities of looking at and planning how we go forward as a church towards a new normal, taking, taking the opportunity to perhaps build our barn back better and how and when we might reopen. We pray for Scotland so that it will be re-evangelised and our national society transformed. Dear wonderful Father God, we reach out to you with our prayer. We ask to be used as channels for your divine power to flow through us, unrestricted in a stream of radiant light into our world, where the human race is suffering the terrible blight of this pandemic. Allow us today to be instruments of your holy power so that your radiant healing power will help to destroy this deadly virus and bring strength, regeneration, healing and inspiration to humanity as a whole. We pray and thank you for all the essential workers on the ground, from policemen and policewomen, from doctors, nurses, parents juggling working and teaching their children at home, paramedics, dustbin men and shop staff, to name just a few. May they be helped in their unselfish work and we thank them for that so much. Keep all those who have and are taking personal risks to help the sick stay safe. We pray that the people we know and the public in general will be responsible, thoughtful and unselfish in their actions and not take unnecessary risks in spreading this disease by their actions or in crowds and gatherings. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that your healing light will flow through our world so that your presence will bring harmony and balance to all. May your will be done this day and may all who help in this crisis and all who you call on be filled with your light and be protected. We ask finally that you bless us all, that we would invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts each day and we would never take you for granted. Amen. Uh, good morning. Um, we have two readings this morning. The first one is um, from Psalms, Psalm 107, reading verses 1 to 9, 23 to 32, and 39 to 43. And then Mark chapter 4, reading verses 35 to 41. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Verse 23. Some went out of the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper and waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for them. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the councils of the elders. And then verse 39. Then their numbers decreased and they were humbled by oppression, calamity and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste, but he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. And then on to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus calms the storm. 
that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping in a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Father God, we come to you again as we have with our voices raised in singing, um, with our hearts open in prayer. And Lord, we come to you now just, just asking that you would speak to us in the way that we need to be spoken to, that we would hear your still small voice today in the storms of whatever part of the storm we are in, however we're experiencing the storm, that we would know and feel and sense your presence with us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. This is, this is part two uh, of seven out of this series, uh, Breaking the Mold. And uh, just to say to you too that the reading plan is available if uh, if you want to view it on uh, catch up you can download it from the from the Barnes website at www.barnchurch.org.uk. But we're continuing on in this journey through Mark and and picking up on different episodes. But you, you remember that New Year's resolution slide that I shared uh, last week that we we kind of had there as a as a real encouragement at the start of this year, although we had no idea how this year was going to turn out. And um, it always raised a smile for us. The last line, which was uh, at the very bottom, to to uh, you know that we would take more naps on boats. Well, this is it. This is the time to take naps on boats. This is it right here. This is the story it refers to. The element of surprise, the, the unexpected thing, the mold breaking that we looked at in Mark 2 last week was who Jesus associated with and who Jesus socialized with. It wasn't the great and the good, but it was those that the great and the good considered to be unworthy. The tax collectors, and sinners that gathered at Levi's house. And as we pick up at one of the famous on the water stories of Jesus and his followers in Mark 4, the issue this time is about trust. The disciples expected Jesus to respond in a certain way to, to danger, but as, uh, as followers, they were expected by Jesus to respond differently. Back at the party, Jesus said clearly that he was here to be close to those who needed him the most. On the boat, he says that those who would be closest to him must learn to trust him in all circumstances. Because simply hanging out with Jesus and simply being in Jesus' presence isn't what following him is all about. Our ability to be at peace in the midst of a storm is totally dependent on the level of faith, of the level of trust that we have in Jesus the Saviour. Now, before we take a closer look at what unfolded on Lake Galilee, I, I want to suggest that reading the Gospels, as we are just now, can be dangerous. Uh, it can be a dangerous thing to do for at least three reasons. There's possibly more. Reason number one is if we're very familiar with the stories of Jesus, we face the danger of skimming and therefore missing uh, something fresh that God wants to say to us right now in this situation. Number two, it's dangerous because if, we're, if the stories are relatively new to us, then the danger is that we get too starstruck by Jesus' physical presence and activity in the story, and also missing the many points that there are to, to pick up on. And the third danger, and maybe this is the most dangerous, if we read it carefully, honestly and openly, then there's a very real danger that God might actually transform us by his word of truth. It should come as no surprise that I'm hoping for level three danger uh, that we'll aim for and receive this morning as we dive into this remarkable story. You know, there are always plenty of 
spot the difference type posts on social media these days, which challenge us to look closely at whatever it is uh, to see whatever it is uh, to see if we can solve it. Um, the kind of thing I'm talking about here is it could be a, a, a picture with a single odd letter or a number that's in amongst a grid of, of other letters or numbers which are all the same. Or maybe one that's more recognizable is a, a picture of a young girl that if you view it upside down becomes an old man. Sometimes we can't see it until we're told how to look at it. And it's the same with well-known Bible stories like the, the boat in the storm. What you see depends on what you're looking for or which way you look at it. So let's try looking at it from some of the different angles and see what appears. Let's look at it from the perspective of the sea. Now, that seems an odd place to start or even to look at all, but the scene makes a difference. Why does a scene make a difference? Well, if you were telling a story that featured people running around in the dark, shooting, losing their lives, that sounds awful. Because maybe you failed to say that it was a description of a game of laser tag or something similar. So the scene is important. The context is important. Now, the Sea of Galilee and its surroundings are quite unusual compared to, say, the North Sea. It's an inland body of water surrounded by various terrain types. And along with the Dead Sea at the other end of the Jordan, it's the lowest uh, body of water in the world. Many of those factors make the conditions that were experienced in the story a very real possibility at any moment and quite regular. It could go from completely calm to dangerously ferocious in a heartbeat as it did on that night when Jesus and the disciples crossed over to the other side. Rather than being an unexpected anomaly, it was well-known and regular feature of traveling this sea. Then let's look at the disciples. Given that a large proportion of them were fishermen who no doubt experienced storms on the sea on an everyday basis, raises the question of why they became so afraid, or perhaps it indicates how fearsome this particular storm actually was. They probably spent more time in boats than on land, and their leader Jesus was a carpenter to trade whilst they were in the middle of their own familiar workplace. And when Jesus suggested they crossed over to the other side, they didn't hesitate and they set off, knowing the destination, knowing the route, and the pitfalls possibly along the way. Yet the storm hits them, and all their confidence and their certainty goes overboard. Even though they were used to choppy waters, this one hit them like a curveball. But aside from that physical scene, surely what they had spent uh, they, what they had spent at least a day by the lake being taught was must have been fresh in their memory, surely. Jesus taught them and the crowds by several parables of the kingdom of God. If you read the earlier part of Mark 4, it's the parable of the sower, the parable of the lamp, the parable of the growing seed. And just before getting into the boat, it was the parable of the mustard seed. And all we can say is that maybe they hadn't yet had the explanation about having faith as small as a mustard seed, they could overcome any situation. But anyhow, here they are in the boat, panicking. And now let's look at Jesus. This story, in case we'd ever forget it, puts into sharp focus the fact that Jesus was both fully human and fully God. He needed to eat, drink, and sleep. He wasn't immune to suffering and harm, just the same as any one of us. Yet just a word from him, and diseases can be banished, demons cast out, dead raised to life, or catastrophe turned into calm as it was on the boat. Jesus was understandably tired after a long day teaching and leading. He was also very familiar with the landscape and the journey suggested uh, they make, that he suggested that they make uh, that evening. It was a, a familiar route to him now, as in, in his earthly ministry, but let's face it, he was also there when that area was created. And that's the thing, nothing's ever a surprise to God. So the looming storm, though unknown to anyone else in the scene, even the sea wasn't aware it was coming. Jesus knew exactly what would unfold. And he also knew what the reactions would be. And he also knew the outcome. 
because neither encyclopedia nor shipping forecast has anything to teach the saviour of the world. Knowing his surroundings and his circumstances and everyone around him, Jesus could quite peacefully recharge with a power nap in the back of the boat, which, by the way, the stern of the boat is the spot where your distinguished guests or VIPs would travel with you. And then let's look at everyone else. We don't hear anything from them, who they were or how they reacted to the storm, but Mark takes care to note in verse 36, there were also other boats with him. Of course, that could be just an insignificant detail of the story, like other words in, in the same verse, such as, just as he was. It doesn't seem to be of any interest whether or not Jesus got changed first or put on a life jacket or whatever before they left the shore, except to convey that it was immediate. Jesus said, let's go over to the other side, and they took him as he was in the boat. Away they went. But I think it's very significant that there were others there in different boats. No doubt experiencing the same thing, but without Jesus on their deck. Though in the thick of it too, they would be observing everything that was happening in the natural of the storm and in the supernatural of it being stopped. And all of the actions and reactions of Jesus and the disciples in their boat. So far from being a simple, insignificant detail, the other boats could be key to our application of the scripture today. Now, not that anyone has been traveling much or going to restaurants and visitor attractions recently, but in the good old days before March, I don't know if you remember this far back, but it would have been common to post a review on websites like TripAdvisor or something similar as well as an experience and perception-based rating, reviews often contain key information for others who would want to get the best from their trip or experience to a particular place. So having briefly visited the various viewpoints on the calming of the storm, what can we say as a summary of it all? Not necessarily for others, but for ourselves as well. Well, coming at the end of his long teaching session, maybe Jesus hoped to see some of the fruit of it in action when that storm came, which, of course, only he knew about. He spent the day teaching them about faith. Then his hearers got the chance to put it into practice. Well, if that was his aim, it didn't happen. But that wouldn't have surprised him anyway. After all of their uh, panic and fear, he asks a question that for him, if, if, and if he were any one of us, would be sad and exasperating. But to the, the disciples, it was a deeply piercing question. Verse 40, do you still have no faith? Obviously they don't, or they don't have much. Now, if Jesus were one of us, he would have said, oh, thanks guys for waking me up. I was knackered. I don't know how I slept through that. But he's not one of us. He said, do you still have no faith? Why didn't you take this the way I was taking this? Why didn't you take my lead? See, it's easy for us to be hard on these poor disciples, though. We're reading this thinking, well, they had Jesus right there with them in the flesh. Why didn't they get it? But if the human heart, as it's been said, has an innate desire to connect with God, but can spend a lifetime not knowing how to fulfill that desire the right way, how can we then expect to understand the things of God with our minds? Only by revelation can we even begin to grasp the very basics. And thanks be to God for the revelation that he gives freely and willingly. And if we read on through the Gospels, the disciples continuously fail to get it. Not, not so much not understanding what Jesus taught, but the, the fundamentally they couldn't get to the full understanding of what he taught because they couldn't get to grips with who he really is. They had the words, but they didn't understand the meaning. Even when they declared him the Messiah, they didn't understand who the Messiah really was and how he was going to appear. It wasn't until they received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, as it's recorded, that true and lasting understanding came. Because it's only with the Holy Spirit that we can begin to see the world through God's eyes. And that's why we sing with expectancy and with uh, a real urgency, breathe on me, breath of God, and fill me with life in you. To love what you would love and do as you would do. 
And even then with the Holy Spirit, there are times for new learning and fresh understanding. Think about Peter's vision that's recorded later on in Acts. And it, it leads to the inclusion of the Gentiles into the, into the main family of the church without having to become Jews first. And that was decided at the Council of Jerusalem as it's um, recorded in Acts 15. But let's not get all the way over there. Let's go back to the boat. We might wonder if what it was for the disciples was that fear just got the better of them. That they asked in verse 38, don't you care if we drown? Maybe that's an understandable fear reaction, notwithstanding what they'd already been taught that day. But it's a very telling question, showing that they didn't really know the VIP who was in their stern. The question itself could be ruled out as evidence due to mitigating circumstances because they were afraid. But their later question seals the deal that they didn't get it. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They really didn't know who Jesus really was. They don't grasp that God was right with them, not just a good teacher and a powerful healer. So when the storm got up and they got scared, they were even more perplexed that Jesus didn't seem to notice the danger that they were in. Then when he stands up and rebukes the storm, they're terrified at what he can do. I think there might be a verse missing at the end of the story which reads, Then Jesus rolled his eyes, shook his head and sighed, and then went back to sleep. But you know, even in the physical presence of Jesus, faith fades fast when times get tough. Once again, he hasn't behaved as they would have expected, and their trust that he is able and willing to carry us through any storm wasn't yet developed. He calms the storm when they ask, though they didn't really ask. What faith that they had became fear, and therefore it puts distance between them and their Savior, even though he was literally in the same boat with them. It happens to us too when we confuse security for safety. We might find ourselves in situations which don't feel or actually aren't safe. Yet in Jesus, we are always secure. As the saying goes, come hell or high water. We're always secure in Jesus. Doesn't mean we'll always be safe. It doesn't mean we'll always be free from harm. Did they really alert Jesus to the danger in that boat? No, he was alerting them to their lack of trust, their lack of faith in him. What they needed to learn, as they later did, thankfully, and, and quite possibly we need to learn it and relearn it too. And here it is in, in a line. When Jesus gets up, the storm backs down. We may not be delivered from the storm, but we may be delivered in it or through it. And I find that a helpful picture that when Jesus gets up, the storm backs down, especially when faced with one of life's storms. But we have to be careful with these sorts of visualizations too, because uh, a critic might come and say, well, yeah. And it was precisely because Jesus took his eye off the ball to get 40 winks that the storm uh, took its chance and, and that could have been avoided if he just paid attention. But once we begin to grasp who Jesus Christ really is. That logic, if you pardon the pun, just doesn't hold water. Jesus is not sleeping on the job when life is tough for us. He's resting in peace. And he can rest in peace because he's in control. As well as sharing some of that power with us, he gifted us that peace. It was his parting gift, as he said in John 14. And isn't it interesting to compare the scene of the storm on the water and the scene of the Garden of Gethsemane just before the cross? In the storm, the disciples are very much awake and Jesus is very much at peace and at rest. And they wake him up and, and accuse him of not being bothered if they drown. Don't you care if we drown? Yet fast forward to the Garden of Gethsemane and you have Jesus who says, stay awake with me. The hour is here. Watch and pray. And they couldn't do it. They were too knackered. They just could not keep their eyes open at the time where their eyes needed to be open. And in the storm, 
they could have rest, rested in peace in the assurance that Jesus had it. Jesus was taking care of it. But in his time of need, of need for prayer and support, they just couldn't stay awake. And it just says so much about our priorities and, and our understanding of who he is and what he's about. We need that discernment as well, to know when is the time for urgency and fervent prayer and when is the time to be at peace, knowing that God has got this. And that's why the Holy Spirit tunes us into God's peace and protection and his presence in us. So even through hard times, all of that happens by the Holy Spirit. We are given that peace and we're tuned into God's direction and his presence with us. And that is broadcast from us on a massive loudspeaker his power to the whole world that's what's broadcast from us with the holy spirit in us that's the effect that the world gets broadcast god's power on on full hd live stream catch up whatever you like uh, whatever you want to call it and it brings us right back to that seemingly insignificant detail earlier about the other boats today it's been my deliberate elephant in the room scenario that in any of this so far, I haven't referenced these unprecedented times or any of the other current buzzwords and phrases. And that's absolutely not because they don't apply. If ever there was a word from God in season, I think this is it, but it applies to any other personal or corporate life storm as well. It's just nice to get a few minutes without that C word being mentioned. But one of the older phrases reused recently has been, well, we're all in the same boat. Which is fine until someone points out that, well, actually, we're not in the same boat. We are in the same storm. Now that does really resonate with our time. Everyone's experiencing the same storm, but it has different effects and is even seen differently from other boats. Now, as the church albeit a global fleet or a family of boats spread across countries and local communities, is one of many boats being battered by a sudden, fierce, unpredictable storm. We need to know, and Holy Spirit needs to remind us, that although it may threaten our safety, it cannot dent our eternal security. But that's the personal message. That's for us in the boat that's labeled the church. But perhaps more importantly is what the other boats see happening in the boat with Jesus on board. What will the education, the business, the government and the community boats see when they look at the church boat? Will it be a supernatural picture of peace and calm? Because that's a boat you'd want to follow, isn't it? Or are its passengers and crew manning the lifeboats to try and escape? With a sense that we are passing the eye of the, the current storm and traversing into the wake of it. I guess we'll soon find out. Are we going to be people in this boat of the church? And are people going to see a picture of peace and calm? Because that is a boat that you'd want to follow. Or are the passengers of the boat named church manning the lifeboats and panicking and fearing for their lives and trying to escape. I wonder which picture people will see as we go forward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the work you've done in our lives, for the work you're going to do in our lives. We pray with thanks for what has gone before us and who's gone before us. And we pray with thanks that today is a new day and tomorrow will be a new day. And Lord, yeah, we pray for the whole world as we have. We pray for others. We pray for the world. We pray for the church. And that Lord, whether it's the big storm that the whole world is facing right now, or whether it's sort of micro storms within all of that, we just don't want to shake you violently and wake you up and, and say that you've abandoned us or you don't care what happens, but Lord, help us to rest in your peace and in your presence. And Lord, help us also to stand against the storm. In your simple words, just say, quiet, be still. 
Lord, help us to have that faith that even if it was as small as a mustard seed, that we can we can bid the storm to back down. So would you help us be filled with that power and the confidence in that power to use it, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>